<laughs> we welcome Father Philip Gamir for this third and final presenta presentation on the introduction to the new directory for catechesis. Our last couple of sessions have certainly been a wonderful, um, enriching, and, and really prayerful experience for us. And so we look forward to our time together here. You know, um, this third section, uh, part three for the new directory is a catechesis in particular churches. And, and I'm excited about this um, as well, because, you know, this really, we begin to delve into how the ministry of the word of God takes shape in concreteness in in ecclesial life and and everything that we're going to be hearing today you know in addition to what we've heard over the past couple of sessions really forms for us tools uh, for episcopal conferences for our bishops around the world you know in various pastoral and academic organizations around the world who who with us the faithful shape catechesis so again we welcome father philip Ganier to our part three introduction to the directory for catechesis welcome father philip thank you so much jane it's always a pleasure to be with you and uh it's good to see you guys see so good to see everyone around here um as we delve into uh the, this last part of the catechetical directory and so let's go ahead and, and pray before we get started in the name of the father and the son of the holy spirit amen Loving Father, pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us that we may be good catechists of your word, your Son, Jesus Christ. Render our minds and hearts so open, receptive, and responsive to your Holy Spirit that, like Mary, we might become a living instrument of your word to others. Help us to be a faithful witness to gospel life so that your church may become ever more alive. Let the fire of your love so enkindle our hearts that we may be instruments of drawing others to love you in the church of your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord and through the intercession of Our Lady of Peace and Saints Damien and Marianne of Molokai. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, um, here we go, our final session, and uh, it'll continue to build on uh, the, the two sessions that we had already, though I'll do a fair amount of repetition. For those of you who are new to today's session, just a word of introduction. Uh, I am um, uh, broadcasting right now from Washington, DC. Washington, it's not sunny like this. It's rather gray, but, um, but that's where I'm at right now. I'm currently a PhD candidate in catechetics at the Catholic University of America. <clears throat> and um, um, as I mentioned in, 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 in posts past, this is going to be fairly fast, um, but I will have, it'll be marathon pace, but I will have the recordings as well as all the slides available because a lot of this stuff is, is theory, you know, though we're going to focus a little bit more on how we transition into practice. So the theory of practice, if you will. And um, yeah, so just to let you know that those will be available. Just by way of repetition. So um, anytime I use the word repetitio, it, it comes from this idea of repetitio est mater studiorum. Repetition is the mother of learning, which is old fashioned Catholic pedagogy that by repeating things, it's a way to remember things. But also uh, studiorum can be a way to understand zeal. It's kind of like the coal that burns. So repetition keeps the zeal alive, if you will. Um, I, anytime I use DC, it's shorthand for Directory of Catechesis, Directory for Catechesis. CCC is Catechism of the Catholic Church. By way of repetitio, once again, we have um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is the summary. It's the what we believe, the directory, is how we implement the catechism. To use the old Latin terminology, fides quae is what we believe. Fides qua, you know, is is how is the how we implement what we believe. Okay. Um, once again, that the, uh, the the goals of these three sessions is to introduce the directory. It's to engage in dialogue as we have been doing. Um, and I, it's been wonderful to read some of the email that, that some of you have been sending, and, and I appreciate that engagement. And, you know, you certainly have my email, and if you want to continue the conversation after we're done today, I'm more than happy to do that. 
And it's also to model the methods that they talk about in the directory. Those methods, once again, is the charismatic method. It's the proclamation of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. It's the mystagogic method. It's theological reflection based on liturgy or the liturgical experience. And it's the artistic method. It's starting, or what the, the old term, Latin term is via pulchritudinus, the way of beauty how we come to know our faith through things that are beautiful. <clears throat> so we talk a lot, we've been talking a lot about food like these past couple sessions. And, and last time we talked about, you know, this idea of analyzing. If we're talking about the best, trying to come up with the best spam fried rice, at some point, we're gonna have to analyze how to make the best fried rice. And so is it wet or dry rice? the type of shoyu, what type of eggs, what kind of sauce you put in. But what we're gonna do now is synthesis. And so yes, while we analyze, we're gonna put it all together. How do the flavors all work together? And we're talking about a blend, but, but bear in mind, this is not blend in the sense of smoothie, okay? So we don't wanna do smoothie, okay? Because it's not where you, all the flavors are indistinguishable. We want, think of fried rice how it comes together. So when you eat, you got to taste the grain of the fried rice. You got to know where the kimchi, if you use kimchi, you got to know where the onion comes in. You got to know where the eggs come in so you can taste it all together, but yet appreciate all the different component parts. Okay. So that's what we mean by synthesis, not blend, but synthesis, you know, just coming, how does it all work together? And when we talk about what working together, we are we're talking about different parts here. So let me go ahead and just repeat by way of repetitio. This is what we did for the first session. So once again, <clears throat> the catechism summarizes the content of faith. The catechetical directory guides how the catechism should be taught in our time. Pope Francis's missionary disciple expands the identity of the catechist from a religion teacher to an evangelist. The kerygma anchors the teaching in the explicit proclamation of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection in a person's life. Catechesis is mystagogic initiation to the extent that we are intentional about reflecting on the liturgical experience and connecting that experience to real life. The virtue mercy allows the catechist to adopt a healing mode if needed, the church's recovery of the via pulchritudinus, or the way of beauty, is a privileged way for God to capture, seize, and shape our lives for a life of truth or goodness, and goodness, excuse me. Let's go ahead and repeat session two. This is the repetitio here. The DC recognizes that to catechize is to engage in a process. The CCC is a general summary of the faith and requires mediation through a variety of methods appropriate to persons and situations. More than a modern educational term, pedagogy expresses an ancient theological truth that God teaches us by revealing himself to us. Because God revealed himself through Jesus, God modeled divine love by emptying himself. Paul's term is kenosis and providing our life and death meaning and purpose. Because of the incarnation, catechesis is not possible unless it is woven into the lives of persons, individually and the full spectrum of the human family. The classroom cannot be the only venue for catechesis. Since catechesis is mystagogical, worship spaces are, are privileged spaces for instruction. And since catechesis is evangelical, other spaces like hospitals, prisons, the mall are possible as well. Discernment is the ability to identify movements of consolation, which is increases of faith, hope, and love, or desolation, decrease of faith, hope, and love in a person's life. And this is the the um, this is the, the the graph that I had been distributing and giving um, definitely our first and our second session. Notice that the, these are the different levels of education. These are the different ways in which the church does education. Um, some of it is mystagogical, some of it is catechetical, some of it is in the realm of religious education, and then education is the broadest sense because the church educates all people who want an education. When we're charismatic and evangelical, 
it can be at any place, you know, during this, in this field, when, when, whenever we educate. Um, what does that look like? Okay, so to put it another way, um, be attentive to the situations because we can be educational, charismatic, mystagogical, catechetical, or evangelical in any place. It doesn't necessarily have to be the classroom. It can be Pearl Ridge. It can be the church. It can be Ala Moana. I mean, it can, it can be anywhere, okay? So you are educational when you have, you have to teach a skill or a lesson in the broadest sense. So your education, let's say you have to teach someone how to, I don't know, balance a checkbook. You teach somebody math. You teach somebody scripture. You're educational. You are evangelical <clears throat> when you share the good news of scripture, particularly the gospels. Okay. You are catechetical when you teach someone in faith as opposed to teaching someone about the faith. Remember, non-Catholics like agnostics or atheists or Protestants can learn about the faith, but not everybody is taught in faith. So anytime you teach someone in faith or some, to teach someone to deepen one's faith, then you are catechetical. You are charismatic when you are explicit about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ for that person. So when you say Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, or Christ died for your sins, or isn't God, isn't Jesus good, um, Christ died for you, that's charisma, and it can happen anywhere. So let's say if a person you know, you're on the beach and, and somebody that you're with recognizes is so taken by the sunset that, that's so beautiful in Hawaii. And they're, they're so overwhelmed by beauty and they recognize how good God is. That can be a charismatic moment and say, see, Jesus did this for you. You can enjoy what Jesus did for you. Or when, um, let's say, when, let's say, when somebody feels sorry, you know, or when somebody feels forgiven for one's sins, Jesus died for you. You don't have to carry this burden because Jesus now carries it for you. That's charisma, okay? You are mystagogical when strictly, when you help a newly baptized person understand the Easter mysteries better. Specifically, those are the 50 days during the Easter season. That's the RCIA process. But broadly, anytime you help a person draw meaning from a liturgical experience. So let's say, you know, in, in Catholic schools, you have to attend mass, you know, um, and, you know, an agnostic goes to mass, but yet here's a very beautiful homily. You know, you as a science teacher can say, oh, you know, what is it about that homily that moves you? And you help this student reflect on that homily. That's being mystagogic. You know, that's when you exercise mystagogy because it's anchored in liturgy. So the best teachers, I think, in my view, can move between these five modes. You just move in between and it happens at any place, at any time. It doesn't have to happen necessarily in the classroom or formally, you know, in let's say when our deacons preach, our deacons are charismatic. It doesn't necessarily have to be formal like that. It can happen at, at, at any time. Granted, the privileged place for catechesis, mystagogy, and charisma is when we worship together as church. But like I said, it can happen at different places. It can happen in the school. It can happen, um, you know, in confession or in a pastoral situation. You know, it can happen, let's say, when you're, you know, argue, doing social justice work, like arguing for pro-life, or with your families when you're making Advent wreaths, or let's say when you're sitting down for dinner, you know, you can have catechetical moments there, or at the end of life, as we talked about last time. Notice that we're not just talking about children. This process is life long, birth and all the way until death. It is a lifelong process, catechesis. The educational process does not stop. And that's something that we have to keep in mind, especially because sometimes the idea is that catechesis is only for little children. On the contrary, it's quite the opposite. It is for adults long-term over the span of life. 
Um, so take a look now at part three. <clears throat> Just a few tone shifts here. Um, in 1971, the, uh, the emphasis here, I would say, would be action. In the 1997 directory, the, the focus was on location. Where does catechesis take place? It takes place in, per, in the particular church, in families, what have you. In 2020, I would say that there's an emphasis on pluralism because Notice in, in this directory, we're talking about catechesis in the particular churches, not just one particular church, but churches, the communion of church. It recognizes complex contexts, and it also talks about the polyhedral phenomenon, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. So that's the tone shift here in terms of um, the, the directory. Notice that the trajectory of the DC is, these are the three parts. It starts off broadly with identity. It moves into content and method, and then it starts to come out here with what I call catechesis incarnate. So what does it look like in particular churches? It starts broadly with revelation. It ends very specifically with the organisms like dioceses and eparchies, which, which reinforce catechesis. Last time at session two, we talked here in this about content and method. The catechism of the Catholic Church kind of brought us to this particular point, and it started to inter once it interacts with the incarnation, that's when catechesis becomes incarnate. Catechesis becomes real and applied because Jesus is not just an idea. Jesus is a person. Jesus came. Jesus has a very specific, it has traction in our lives. So now let's take a look at um, chapter nine. I'll pause so that you can just get a sense. Okay. Um, one point that I want to focus on in this particular chapter is this idea of particular churches or the particular church. To understand a particular church, we must first understand communion. So communion is understood in two senses here. It's understood in terms of daily bread. So let's say what we take at mass. And it's also understood in terms of church. So DC 283 says, God wished to gather his church around his word and he nourishes her with the body and blood of his son. So that's the daily bread. On the flip side, you hear um, in D.C., quoting Benedict the 16th, the people of God has always found strength in the word of God, that is the daily bread, and the ecclesial community, that is the church, which grows by hearing and celebrating and studying that word. And notice that we need both, because daily bread without the church is just individual spirituality. And church without daily bread becomes a transnational charity. So communion in this full sense is the intersection between daily bread and church. That's how to understand communion when we understand particular church. So now a particular church is this in, cate in the catechism. It is a diocese. It is a particular church, is a community of the faithful in communion of faith and sacraments whose bishop has been ordained in apostolic succession. A diocese is usually determined is usually a determined geographic area. Sometimes it may be constituted as a group of people in the same rite or language. In Eastern churches, it's an eparchy, not a diocese. The significance of this is this. The church is incarnate. It is real when we in are in communion with our bishop. So we are real in a full sense when we are around our bishop. So the bishop is not middle management to the pope. Don't think of it like a multinational corporation. We are fully church when we are in communion with other particular churches, especially with the Church of Rome. So the Pope is the bishop of the particular church in Rome. 
One way of looking at church is as an institution. And here I commend models of the church by Avery Cardinal Dulles, who talks about different models of the church. And this is one way, albeit an incomplete way of looking at church. So you can think of it as Rome on top, bishops over here in the middle, and then people on the bottom. But what this particular directory is trying to emphasize is this idea of communion of churches, that Rome animates. It is the first among equals. John Paul in particular really wanted to find some way to, to be in communion with the, the churches of the East. And he talks about the churches of the East as the two lungs of Christianity. Some churches are working to be in communion with Rome. Um, I, I would say, let's say like Anglicans and Lutherans, for instance, we've been, there's a lot of theological talk about how we can be in communion together. And there are some churches which are not in communion with Rome. Okay. You know, each diocese is its own little circle here. There's Hawaii right over there. Okay. We are in communion with the church of Rome. All right. So just by way of review from Vatican II, which is considered the great catechism of modern times from Paul VI, it really stretched our understanding of the church. And by repetition from the 16 Vatican II documents, four are, very, are particular and those are constitutional. The one that I want to focus on right now is Lumen Gentium, which is number two right over here. By way of repetition, or um, uh, Lumen Gentium here is the light of the people. And if you have more time, this is essential and important reading because it really helps us understand what church is. It's the architecture by which we do our catechesis. Notice that we're not talking about the pyramid model here. We're not talking about institution. It first talks about the church as a mystery, as people of God then hierarchy, but then we have to talk about what hierarchy means or just review what hierarchy means. Then we talk about laity, the call for everybody to holiness. And so this particular constitution emphasizes how all of us are church together. By way of review, uh, uh, excuse me, by way of review, we talked about Paul McPartland, um, who works here at Catholic University, and he helps us understand how these constitutions are the underpinning architecture for catechesis. So we have Dei Verbum, which talks about scripture, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which talks about liturgy, Lumen Gentium is what we just covered, which is church as the body of Christ. Then Gaudium et Spes is how the church relates in the modern world. This is the architecture to understand this concept is to understand how our catechesis works, you know, um, in our church today. So we can look at hierarchy. In one sense, we do have a hierarchical structure and that leader is at the top. You have managers and followers. But by way of review from our first session, hierarchy really is not so much you know, a managerial term, it's a theological term, or more specifically, a Christological term. Hierarchy is the sacred or priestly power of Jesus. It talks about Jesus, not so much management style. So we're, we all participate in that. It's not just the Pope telling us what to do. But it's all of us participating, identifying the ways in which the Spirit works in our hearts, identifying the way in which the Spirit works in our small community, parish or school, identifying the way in which those small communities support Bishop Larry, and then we work together and become the body of Christ together. So we all participate in the one priesthood of Christ. We all have a part to play. Everybody has a responsibility here. So practically speaking, what does this mean? To what extent do we sensitize our students to the local or particular church? Do they know the bishop? Do they know coworkers? Do they know the priorities of the bishop? To what extent do we sensitize our students to the universal church? Do they know the priorities and concerns of the US church or the whole church? Do they know about Eastern Catholic churches and how we all work together and everyone brings a different aspect of, of being a body of Christ together? To what extent do I take responsibility in my parish? Do I think that it's somebody else's job to do that? 
in what way do I help stretch the imagination? If I'm being moved, if the spirit is moving me, do I tell my community? Do I tell my boss? Do I tell my pastor? Uh, if my if my if the spirit is moving me to be prophetic or to contribute, do I listen and obey? So grace doesn't just come from the Pope down, but it comes from the bottom up as well. So hierarchy, not just top down, it's all it it has to flow. It's everybody participating. Otherwise, church doesn't work. Okay, let's take a look at chapter 10 now. So this one is a pretty loaded chapter over here, and I want to focus on four, uh, four ideas here. Take a minute just to see how it's structured. Okay, let's take a look at this idea of pluralism and complexity. Um, the, the DC will use this idea of a polyhedron. And uh, the model of the polyhedron is used to explain the relationship between localization and globalization. So notice how complex that polyhedron is. It's not just, you know, a two-dimensional figure here. Used also to express charisms and gifts in the community. Reflects the dynamic of the pastoral discernment of complex situations. So thus, while there is an integrity and a unity to catechesis, there is no one uniform approach to mediating it. Once again, while there is an integrity and a unity to catechesis, there is no one uniform approach to mediating it. Practically speaking, we don't just shove the catechism down people's throats. We have to digest it for people. We have to help people come alive. That is that is primarily to help bishop and cat, uh, bishops and catechists to help transmit the faith. That's really critical here. Other because some people just shove it down. And then sometimes people get turned off. Some people really like it, but we have to understand who we're talking to and we have to discern the particular contexts there. Let's talk about science now. So Father Robert Spitzer is was born and raised is born and raised in Honolulu. Uh, he's a Punahou graduate, class of 1970. He joined the Jesuits and earned a PhD in philosophy at the Catholic, at Catholic University of America, and he's now the retired president of Gonzaga University in Washington State. Um, he heads the catechetical website Credible Catholic, which aims to bring science and faith together. And he was featured in the Catholic Herald in 2018. And it's important, Father Spitzer's work, along with other scientists or science-minded people, are really important to emphasize because people think that to be scientists, to be science means to be anti-religion. Quite the contrary. You know, he's trying to, through his website here, is trying to show how science and catechesis can support one another. In fact, if you look at these resources, you can get all sorts of free material there, um, you know, if you're interested. But this particular, his particular work is based on this 2016 survey. And I realize it's 2020, but it'll make sense in just a little bit why I choose 2016. It's because in 2016, it talks about how religion is in steep decline. 39% um, in 2016 identify none as their religious affiliation, and hence you have the nuns. Now, they anticipate, it's now 2020, but they anticipate this will grow to 50% by 2023. That's just three years away. And it's fueled primarily by four secular myths that science has proven that God does not exist. Suffering proves that God does not exist. You know, if, if God was all loving, they would argue that he would stop suffering. Humans are just like other animals. There's no proof of transcendence in the soul, and there's no real proof of Jesus's existence or resurrection. And so what, what Father Spitzer, as well as other science-minded catechists are trying to do is to undermine these myths because those are not true. In fact, Pope Benedict XVI says that there is a friendship between science and faith. 
And so anything that we can do to help people become more scientific as they deepen their faith actually harmonizes with what we are, who we stand for as Catholics. Let's look at now on new religious movements. So we're not just talking about here, um, I know like New Hope or um, University Church and all of these churches in Hawaii. I mean, when I was at UH, I mean, people were just so aggressive about, you know, let's say things like New Hope and all of these Pentecostal and evangelical churches. And that, that, is, that is something that I think is important to talk about. But when we're talking about your new religious movements, it's not only that, but also what um, the, the catechetical directory says, the phenomenon and the proliferation of new religious movements, which include realities that are differentiated and not easy to classify. And here they name a few. So magic, superstition, neo-paganism, spiritualism, Satanism even, human potential movement, materialism, consumerism, individualistic culture, secularism. Um, there's no time to focus on all of these. I would love to, but you know, for, for, for time's sake, I'm only gonna focus on this idea of the human potential movement because I think, it's per, I think this needs a lot of discernment and discussion. The human potential movement is this idea that we get you know, from this Maslow hierarchy of needs that one can become our best selves. And we hear this all the time. Be who you can be, be your best self, achieve it. And that is good. That is very holy to be one's fullest and truest self. But there also is a dark side. You know, Do we give ourselves permission to be human? Are we content and are we grounded in who we truly are? So for instance, do we compare to other people ourselves to other people and then despair that we're not like so and so, we're not like so and so? Do we suffer from low self-esteem? Are we a workaholic? Are we too busy that you avoid relationships? Are you okay with failure? In other words, are you okay with being human? Because humans fail from time to time. I don't know if, you've, um, if you're aware of this, but are you familiar with this particular film called Won't You Be My Neighbor? Um, this, is, this is a documentary uh, based on the life of Mr. Rogers. And I think this is essential viewing. I think this is so important to watch. Now, bear in mind, this documentary is different from the movie starring Tom Hanks called Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. This is excellent too. Tom Hanks is amazing. We love Tom Hanks. But I want to, and I would recommend this movie too, but I would recommend this one, this, this movie. Bring your Kleenex because you're never going to, you're not going to survive, you know, with a dry eye here. It's, it's intense. But at one point in this documentary, it, it chronicles how Mr. Rogers started his, you know, his, um, his work on TV. And you may know that he was a Lutheran minister. And so he was a Christian teacher in many ways. He was an evangelist and he evangelized that way. But at one point he talks about how, if you remember the movie Superman, which came out in 1978, and that it had a particular religious, it had a particular educational effect on children, specifically, he noticed that when Superman came out, Mr. Rogers observed that upon the release of the 1978 super film Superman, a number of children in their excitement pretended that they were indeed Superman. In other words, they got in because they, they would put, you know, they would pretend they were Superman and they would jump out of their windows. They would jump out of trees and they got hurt, you know, because they couldn't fly. And so he had to go on the show and say, children, you are human and you cannot fly. So he had to teach that about that. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a cute but very telling example of how we can distort ourselves from being inhuman in many ways. And let me explain. So when we take a look, let's say, at the superhero film franchise, over the course, every year, 
I mean, there are more superhero films that emerge, you know, and I mean, nothing, nothing against superhero films. I mean, they, they're, they're fun. They can be very entertaining and in many ways too, I mean, very culturally significant. So for instance, if you rem if you look at Jason Momoa, for instance, you know, from Hawaii, I mean, he was Aquaman, you know, and that meant a lot for the people of Hawaii because, you know, Hawaii kind of had their own superhero. Or you look, let's say, Black, Black Panther in 2018, which which really captured the imagination of, of people, especially the African-American population. I mean, you have to ask, is Black Panther just another movie? Remember, let's say, when Chad Bozeman died not too long ago, who was the star of Black Panther, you know, African-American kids, died. they were devastated. Look on the left-hand side. They were just crushed, you know, by the way, when upon hearing upon Black Panther's death, Black Panther's death. And when you look at, let's say, with the life of Chad Bozeman, you know, what he's done, you know, as a Howard University graduate, and particularly in the Black Lives Matter movement, which is which has really taken our country and our church. I mean, it's it's not just a country thing, but it's a church thing, as you see in the top right hand corner, because racism is so real. You know, these movies help us really sensitize us to a lot of, you know, so cu cultural and social realities. Take a look at the, 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 the top 10 movies in 2019. Look at what kind of movies we have. You know, Disney, we have superheroes. So it just goes to show like what kind of imagine what is capturing the imagination, not just of our youth, but of, of our culture. So all to say, <clears throat> that as much as we like to indulge in superhero culture and superhero ideas, you know, it's important to contextualize that we are not superhuman. We are human. We are not God. Jesus is God, you know. And so as our work as catechists contextualize, I think that becomes a really important idea here. So I want to pause here and 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 pay and just do a quick clip of this very important scene from Will You Be My Won't You Be My Neighbor? And here I'm gonna play this scene with Mr. Rogers and Officer Clemens, in which they're cooling off together in the same pool. This was aired in 1969. Bear in mind, here is a social context: segregated pools in the United States. Racism was at a fever pitch. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. Take note of the use of technology. Take note of how socially and theologically topical Mr. Rogers and Officer Clemens are. Is there an educational value? Is there a catechetical value here? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and pause. I will pause here and I will share, <clears throat> excuse me. I will share now. Um, Okay, here we go. You don't hear any sound, right? I presume. Oh, oh there we go. As always, your highness. Oh, it's not very strong, folks. Hmm. Well, you could just get a sense of, I mean, just get a sense of this, you know. Um, the point here is that Officer Clemens um, was a character on, on Mr. Mr. Rogers. I would be very happy to be on your program as long as it doesn't interfere with my singing. We've had it and now we can go. We don't want the snow anymore. And he teased me. He teased me about that for 20 years. He said, Officer Clemens, are we interfering with your career? Are we interfering? He was relentless, but he also told me, he said, that was the moment I loved you. He said, because you were not going to kiss my ass. Those are Mr. Rogers' words. Mm, that feels good. Oh, there's Officer Clemens. Hi, Officer Clemens. Come Hello, in. Mr. Rogers, how are you? Fine. Won't you sit down? Oh, sure. Just for a moment. It's so warm. I was just uh, putting some water on my feet. Oh, it sure is. Would you like to join me? 
That looks awfully enjoyable, but I don't have a towel or anything. Oh, you share mine. Okay, sure. Around the country, they didn't want black people to come and swim in their swimming pools. And Fred said, that is absolutely ridiculous. Today, trouble under a noon sun. Negroes and white rabbis marched to a segregated hotel with these results. Manager James Rock told them to get off his private property, tossed uh, cleaning chemicals inside the pool in an effort to get the Negroes to leave. My being on the program was a statement for Fred. Cool water on a hot day. Hmm. So, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's one of those films that, that I think, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, it's one of those films that I think is, is worth watching, you know, as, uh, as a pedagogue, as a catechist. Um, you really get to see the way in which, you know, Mr. Rogers, you know, works with just very basic things. Um, and he just, you know, he kind of, he's very effective that way. Okay, so now I'm trying to start my my slides up again. And for some reason, it's not doing that. Hang on. Oh, a computer's slow today. Hang on. Oh. Okay, it's coming on. It's just a little slow. Okay. Where am I here? All right, slideshow, share. Share screen. Okay, can you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, very good. Praise Jesus. Here we go. <laughs> Right. Okay, so um, back to this idea here. So you can see there was a reprise of this scene in 1993 where Officer Clemens came back on the show and they kind of talked about the dynamic again. But the here is the, the idea here is the use of technology. Take a look at how you know technology was used. While Mr. Rod what was interesting about you know Mr. Rogers is that while he embraced the TV platform, he was also deeply critical of TV's superficiality and rapid speed. And so that's why if you remember the Mr. Rogers show is pretty slowly paced because that allowed you know um, children you know to just kind of not be so frantic you know that they would get in from cartoons. And though Mr. Rogers was not explicitly religious, there was a potential overlap with, let's say, the social justice tra the tradition, mor the moral tradition. There's, you're talking about loving and serving. And then even liturgical. I mean, you can even link this to this idea of washing of, washing of the feet. Okay. Now let's talk about digital culture. Ironic, since we just had all these problems with all this idea of with the digital, uh, digital here. Digital culture is not defined in the, in the directory for catechesis. And so here I'm looking for a definition from Deacon Matthew Hallback, who publishes with Sadlier. He's a catechist. And he says that digital culture describes the emergence online of the cultural elements of society, language, communication, customs, values, and expectations. Through its own organization and use of these cultural elements, digital culture is quickly shaping modern culture. The general characteristics though, the DC will talk about characteristics and it will talk about how it characterizes the contemporary world and has become, um, as we know in a short time, ordinary and continuous, so much so that it is perceived as natural. It's not only um, part of existing cultures, but it is asserting itself as a new culture. 
worldwide scale, pervasive. And in 362, it talks about these two ideas, two sets of people, digital natives, those who were born with the ability to use technology, and then digital immigrants, those not born into the digital world, like myself, you know, and had to learn and adapt and adjust. These are some positives and negatives of digital culture that, uh, that the DC talks about here. <clears throat> Opportunity for dialogue, social political engagement, reaching out to the young, um, and then some negatives, loneliness, manipulation, violence, which includes cyberbullying and pornography, which we all know so well, especially in our schools, dark webs, addiction, loss of reality, or fake news as we know in politics. Bishop Franz Peter Tebarts von Elst, who was the delegate for catechesis at the Pontifical Council for the promotion of the new evangelization, writes this in the Catholic University Directory for Catech um, Journal here. He argues that the digital culture with its encompassing digital communication is creating new ways of relating and indeed new forms of communicating that present challenge to the transmission of the faith. We do not yet know what the real blessings are and what the new boundaries are or limits of these changes. And so we're talking about just being in a place of you know, we, we're still figuring out, we're still figuring all of this stuff out and we need to continually discuss and have discernment around this. And so in that spirit of what Bishop Tebarts von Elst says, um, I'd like for us to break into discussion groups now and consider this. What are the blessings and boundaries of digital culture in your catechetical ministry? In what way do you see grace? In what way might you be concerned? So let's break in, into our groups for about seven minutes, you know, and then we'll, we'll call you back at the end of seven minutes. Okay. Thank you, Father Philip. So I will be um, sending you into rooms now, but groups <clears throat> of um, two or three. And um, if you're unfamiliar, if it's the first time joining us, you'll um, just go ahead and click the join button when you see it appear on your screen. And then I will give you a 30 second um, reminder to call us back together again. All right. Thank you and enjoy your time together. Okay, welcome, every welcome back, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue on. Um, hope that your discussions were good, and if you want to talk about some of those things that you, in your group afterwards, I'm happy to stay and, and chat. Okay, so just to, to put a, a final punctuation on this, just something from um, Alina Mauro da Silva from Brazil says, I mean, she is a PhD student from Brazil, and she argues in the journal, um, in the Social Media and Faith Formation Journal from Santa Clara University, she argues a couple of things here. She says that it should be focused less, when we're talking about digital culture and faith formation, she argues focusing less on a transmission model of teaching and more on the culture of sharing, because sharing is what, is, what defines this idea of digital culture. And she argues something very interesting here where she says, and I quote, we should not try to be experts in technology, which should, which might be rather consoling to, I know to me, um, and maybe to other people as well, but in the human beings that produce, use, and inhabit the digital. Thinking about a new pedagogy for the age of connectivity is not about designing online application activities, Rather, it is realizing that cultivating relationships has become more essential than storing content. Okay. Um, if you're talking about, let's say, the, uh, this idea of uh, debating between the extent to which we have content or, or this idea of sharing, bear in mind, remember what uh, Cardinal Dulles said when my, during my first uh, presentation, um, where he, he talked about different types of models of catechesis. And those are legitimate and all important, but they do not cancel each other out. So in other words, if you're liturgical, you still need to be doctrinal. If you're aesthetic, you need to be practical. If you're experiential, you need to be charismatic. We don't sacrifice any of these elements. So if you're digital, we still have to talk about content, how that becomes what what is still transmitted through the digital. 
Let's take a look now at chapter 11, Catechesis at the Service of the Enculturation of the Faith. And two, uh, two short ideas here, enculturation and local catechisms or local, yeah, local catechism. On this theme of enculturation, <clears throat> I get my ideas here from Father Anskar Chapungo, who was a Filipino Benedictine priest, died in 2013, but he was really instrumental and really shaped the world of our understanding of enculturation. And he argues that when cultures come into contact with each other, we're talking about two primary dynamics, either acculturation, where you have two cultures coming together and are placed side by side, kind of like how A plus B equals AB, or enculturation, A plus B equals C. Two cultures come together and both cultures change mutually while maintaining their respective identities. And so whenever we talk about the enculturation of the faith, it has to impact Hawaii, and Hawaii has to impact Rome. So, I mean, we have to talk about and how do we come into contact and shape and develop something new while maintaining our distinct identities. Enculturation, the DC says, is at its heart aimed at the process of the internalization of the experience of faith. Some methods of enculturation here, which to the, the, I'll emphasize what the DC says, is to get to know deeply the culture of persons, recognizing that the gospel possesses its own cultural dimension, communicating the true conversion that the gospel will affect culture, making it understood that the seeds of the gospel are already present in the culture. So it's not so much bringing Christ to the culture, but bringing Christ out of the culture. Those are two fundamentally different modes. Making sure that the new expression of the gospel according to culture does not neglect the integrity of the contents of the faith. So, and when we talk about culture in the DC, we, we are talking about culture in its broadest sense. So it's not the difference between Chinese, Japanese, how do you, how do you minister to you know, uh, the nuns, how do you minister to those who are older, but it's culture in its broadest sense. Now let's talk about the local catechism. And here, um, I mean, we can go on and on about what local means, but here I'll just talk about one, which is the United States Catholic Catechism. And we can talk about so many others, but we just don't have time. And if you want specific ideas afterwards, we can certainly talk and, and give you some ideas of where what some publishing houses have off, publishing houses have offered. But here's one in particular that I want to highlight, which is, is the American way in which we try to digest and break down uh, the catechism and the directory. And notice that this particular resource breaks it down by sharing a story. It applies it to teaching. It offers sidebars of, of, of information, um, relationship to culture, questions for discussion. It talks about doctrinal statements as well as ways to pray with the material. Now let's talk about chapter 12, which is the organisms at the service of catechesis here. Take a look there as to what, um, what this, how this is organized. Now I'll talk about three things here, the Roman Curia, the idea of catechesis to adults, as well as Mary. Um, on the Roman Curia, um, here's the, the, the website of the Holy See, and it's kind of neat, if you're interested in this type of stuff, I think it's, it's kind of neat just to see how our church is arranged, juridically speaking. I just want to draw your attention to the various offices here in the Roman Curia, and I'll talk about what ha that has to do with catechesis in just a little bit. But you can see the various, various offices within uh, the Roman Curia here. And here, I want to emphasize just a few things. Um, the right over here, the purple circle here is the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. That is very historical, um, and it's it's 
this is where like, uh, you know, this manages doctrine, the, the catechism, the CCC comes from this office. The green arrow is where those of you who are teaching in Catholic schools, this is the office that administers, um, you know, how Catholic education is run in the church. This red arrow is the congregation of the clergy. The first two directories came out of this office. Again, the catechism came from here. The directories came from here. Hoffman of Spino at Boston College uh, makes, you know, points out the fact that it's important to see that this directory comes from here, the blue circle the Pontifical Council for Promoting New Evangelization. That's pretty, it's a really minor issue, but it's really significant because we're saying that evangelization is the key here when we're talking about catechesis. It's a joint responsibility, unlike the previous directories which came and instructed clergy. We're now talking about catechesis that's not simply in the domain of priests, but it's a shared responsibility. So that's what's really significant. And I want to draw your attention to how this directory is related to um, the Holy See. Let's talk about now um, this idea of adults. <laughs> Dr. Jane Regan, who is a professor of theology and religious education at Boston College, argued back in 2002 that in her book, Toward an Adult Church, the vitality of the church depends on establishing a new educational paradigm that is focused on adults. Think about that. Adults. This is what the DC says, and it's, it, it comes also from the General Catechetical Directory from 1997. The organizing principle which gives coherence to the various catechetical programs offered by a particular church is attention to adult catechesis. This is the axis which revolves the catechesis of other age groups. Because I think that there's this impression that catechesis is a child thing. It's a young person thing, which is true. But that's not what the church is trying to draw our attention to. The gravity of catechesis is lifelong and it centers and is rooted in adults. Why? Because adults transmit the faith. And we also grow in faith. We don't just remain children in our faith. We become adults in our faith. And this will be made clear with my discussion here on Mary as pedagogue. And, and just as a review, once again, from the earlier slides from Vatican II and from our discussion on number two of Lumen Gentium, look as to where the constitution of the church ends, right over here, chapter eight, on Our Lady. So Mary is the, the model, is the pedagogue, is the way in which we are church. And that's enshrined here in DC uh, 428. One of my favorite, my absolute favorite images of Mary comes from uh, Brother Joseph Aspel, who's based in California. He was a Marianist brother. And he, he was, when uh, John Paul II um, was visiting California, um, he was the commissioned papal artist. And you'll see, you know, when you compare it to, let's say, different aspects of Mary, in what way Aspel's particular, uh, you know, uh, statue or sculpture is, is fundamentally different. Notice right away in Aspel's depiction, she is older. I mean, I don't know of any other, I mean, any other piece of art that portrays an old Mary. If you do, let me know. I'm, I'm really curious. You know, she's sitting down. She's life size. There is no veil. You see her femininity. You know, no snake that she's, she's, she's crushing. Neckline is open. Again, a very feminine, very sensual uh, depiction. No crown. So in many ways, just like as, um, as Elizabeth Johnson, the feminist uh, theologian will talk about, we were seeing Mary as sister, as opposed to Mary as queen. We relate to her that particular way. Her hands are open. Her knees are apart. Think about that. That's pretty bold. 
you know, for religious art of Mary that her knees are apart, you know, kind of gives this idea of, you know, giving birth or the pieta. It's ground level. And there's this idea that the older version of Mary, it's, it's more of a wisdom figure that, and I think that's important for so many of our church to hear because we don't throw away old people. We value, we value the elderly. We value wisdom. And there's something deeply and inherently catechetical about that. When I was working in California, I was so moved when I saw, I mean, that particular statue is all over, it, all over the country. But when I was working in California as a parish priest, I saw in the Diocese of San Jose that they had commissioned this particular artist. And you'll notice that here's a view from the top in their church. And then here's a view on their side, on the right-hand side. The statue of Mary, <clears throat> I'll show you with the arrows. It's in a very, very prominent place, you know, in the church building. From this particular view, you see the statue of Mary. She is in the congregation. And notice where Mary is looking. She is looking at the altar and looking at the tabernacle here. She is worshiping along with us. The gaze is opening, you know, the gaze draws us to the worship of Christ. From the perspective of the altar, you can see that Mary is right over there. And, and I've always seen people touch, you know, children sit on her. Um, it's kind of neat just to see how Mary is in the congregation um, in a place of reverence, in a place of, of, of obedience, of openness. So now, as we conclude, <clears throat> final repetition here. The, a particular church is a community of the faithful whose bishop has been ordained in apostolic succession. The church is incarnate or it is real when we are in communion with our bishop. We are fully church when we are in communion with the other particular churches, especially with the Church of Rome. Digital culture, while it is still hard to define and yet to be understood fully, it describes the phenomenon by which people, natives and immigrants engage technology. Such a phenomenon should be embraced yet discerned in relation to transmitting the faith and establishing relationships. Catechesis that is enculturated is a faith that is internalized in, shaped by, and prophetic to a particular culture. The organizing principle and axis by which faith formation revol revolves is adult catechesis. Mary, in her fullness of life, young and old, is a treasured pedagogue in our tradition. Once again, that it's faith seeking understanding, that is our tradition. We understand that the, the, the world's logic is we understand, then we believe, but the church says, in order to believe, in order to understand, we have to believe first. Now, um, at this point, because we had all of those glitches, you know, earlier today, I'm a little bit behind, and um, I would like to have to finish off our final ten minutes, uh, you know, with an examine. Um, and anybody who wants to ask questions, I'm happy to stay as long as you want after eleven o'clock, you know, to field questions. But I think it's important just to talk about, you know. Just to honor and respect, you know, you who've come, you know, and I'm very grateful for your, for, you know, your presence and your engagement. And I think that let's just take a moment to reflect on as to what the Lord might be saying to us through these webinars and what the Lord might be stirring in us. And I'll do that through the examine, which is a bedrock prayer from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. The fundamental belief of St. Ignatius is that God is laboring in one's life and in the world. The examine is different from the examination of conscience, where the starting point for that prayer is sin. Instead, the examine, the starting point there is to identify where God has been working over a particular period of time. So the spiritual discipline then is to open the eyes. And it's meant to be prayed. We Jesuits pray this once a day for approximately 10 to 20 minutes. Our novices pray this twice a day. Mother Teresa's sisters pray this about twice a day. Um, so it's, it's a part of the prayer diet of those of us who follow in the footsteps of St. Ignatius. From IgnatianSpirituality.com, they provide this prayer card over here, which, which kind of gives you a summary as to how to pray. And so for a few minutes here, maybe for three to four minutes, or maybe let's say, say three minutes, let's just 
take a moment to pause and, um, and just to ask and recognize where the Lord might be moving. And so let's take a moment, please, to ask for God's light as we close this time of prayer and these close these webinars together. Let's take a moment to give thanks. Give thanks for this privilege of gathering together, even in spite of COVID. Give thanks for the, the privilege of this vocation. Give thanks for the resources that we have. Now let's spend a minute of review. If there's anything over the past hour or anything in this and these three webinars that stuck out to you, identify it. What's one thing that stuck out to you? Now take a moment to ask the Lord, the Lord who looks at you with kindness and grace, who delights and who is grateful for your work as his catechist. Ask the Lord what he wants you to learn from that you've identified. What does he want you to be attentive to? Take a moment now to ask for God's grace to help keep your eyes on him. Take a moment now to be grounded in hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we had more time, I would make us look at the Maui sunset here, but we just don't have time. But you could, you guys are lucky. You can, you can see the sunset anytime you want. I have to look at pictures. So, um, okay. So some final closing thoughts. All right. So uh, once again, you know, uh, from this idea of Mr. Rogers here, one of the things that was really significant, I think you'll notice in the documentary is that when Mr. Rogers first started his work on TV, he very much identified with Daniel here, you know, Daniel the Tiger, you know, and Daniel the Tiger, you know, this documentary will talk about how it represents his inner child. But towards the end of his life, it was interesting how Mr. Rogers then identified it more with King Friday. He developed towards the end of his life a more kingly, prophetic, authoritative role you know, in his work as teacher. And I think there's something very important to learn from this, that if we're talking about, if we're taking seriously adult catechesis, that it invites all of us to look at the ways in which we are maturing, how we are growing in our faith, and then growing in our own prophetic ability, you know, in order to become more full catechists, more alive catechists, more wise catechists in that way. Second idea is this. Pope Francis talks about the church as a field hospital. If we take this particular idea seriously, then our work then is, you know, we, we talked about in the first session here, the, the, the importance of mercy. That mercy, then instead of, um, you know, starting with the position first of correcting, then healing, then instructing, then we have to take seriously this idea of healing first, then instructing, then correcting. Okay, it's the, the emphasis, and that particularly matters. If we talk about this idea of the work of the church as a field hospital, then we have to talk about those of us who work in this hospital, we have to diagnose the need. We have to figure out what it is that we can do and then respond accordingly in the right amount, in the right time, in the right place. 
you know, from the, uh, the the previous slide here is sometimes that our work is you have to be educational here. You have to be charismatic at this point or mystagogical. I mean, you have to be very flexible depending as to what, you know, the person needs at a given point in time. We now, and then our final point here, um, we talk about this idea of the treasury of the faith. That is a common idea that comes from the very, very beginning of the church, that we have a treasure to share. Once we start taking our faith seriously, we realize that treasure is not a thing, but it's ultimately a person. It's not something that's you know, linked to, to the past, but it's something that is living. It's not something that is, you know, um, just stagnant, but it, it continually calls us to grow. And we realize too that ultimately in the end that Jesus Christ is the living treasure and it's most vibrant and most celebrated when we gather around our local church. That's where we hope that everything that we do in terms of our educational enterprise is geared. So with that note, um, thank you very much. And um, I realize that you know, we have just three minutes left before 11 o'clock, but I'm here to, I mean, I'm happy to stay as long as you want to field questions, but um, you know, thank you very much you know, to all of you for your witness, for your engagement you know, in this webinar series. I, I pray God's blessings upon you and your ministry. And so, um, you know, Jane, I, I, don't, I don't know how you want to handle it. If you want to stop the recording now and then transition to questions or however you want to handle it. Yeah, so thank you, Father Philip. And I, I just wanted to uh, formally thank you so much for these three outstanding presentations. And I know that everyone who participated and those who watched the video um, after the video recordings have, have truly been enriched um, personally, spiritually, you know, catechetic in on all ways. So thank you for accepting our invitation and presenting it to us in a way that so lovingly speaks of who we are as the church in Hawaii. And I do encourage everyone here to um, to continue to read and digest, you know, the directory in, in bits, you know, in bite-sized pieces. Encourage others, please, to uh, come to the website, the Religious Education website, uh, www.catholichawaii.org. Um, look under religious education where these videos are um, uploaded and encourage others to uh, enjoy these videos and, and learn more about the directory for catechesis themselves. Certainly for those of you who are in the privileged position of being formal catechists and teachers and such, um, to share these videos with others, uh, th that's why we do record them and we welcome you to use them um, in whichever way you feel is appropriate for those uh, with whom you minister. Um, and, and try to take an aspect of it a little bit at a time, uh, develop it. Uh, mine is a charismatic catechesis. And certainly this, this one about um, the digital cultures and, uh, you know, take it in bite-sized pieces to see how we can be better at um, ourselves uh, understanding who Christ is and, and salvation and what salvation means to ourselves. How we can bring this message of mercy and salvation and healing uh, to others so that all may come to know and love and serve Christ. So again, thank you, Father Philip, for your time. And You're very welcome. I, I understand that some of you may have to leave. So thank you and aloha. We